Daisy's helping me moving the slides. So the next slide, please. Um, first of all, <clears throat> uh, just back to what to to put it in perspective again about nematodes. As you can see, most nematodes are in fresh water, marine, um, uh, uh, in the marine in the sea, <laughs> and then we have some animal parasites that Danny kindly shared uh, <laughs> with us. And then finally, we have the plant parasites that are only 10% of the proportion, but they, yet they are very important. And then when we're talking about soil nematodes, it's what we are talking about today in terms of plant parasitic nematodes, mainly soil nematodes. Um, we have plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> predatory nematodes, uh, fungal feeders, and bacterial feeders. In fact, Kanan, uh, Kanan at the end will talk more about this, uh, but just to, to give you perspective. Anyway, so why plant parasitic nematodes? Well, I think Danny um, highlighted why. They are definitely important pests of crops, um, and, um, but they have these unspecific symptoms, so you don't, often, don't always know that you have a nematode problem. So the problem with maybe managing them is that um, you often come in too late, um, like the damage is already done when you, when you have that nematode problem. <clears throat> um, so, and again, yeah, this is just a repeat um, <clears throat> back to the symptoms that they are not specific um, and they are more like, uh, what's the word? Um, um, like evidence of lack of, um, of nutrients, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> anyway, so let me repeat the question that Danny asked in the beginning and I think I know the answer, but do you now think you have a nematode problem? Yeah, so that's launched. So everybody, if you'd like to cast your votes. No water, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Huh? 100% say yes. <laughs> oh my God, that's, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> that is better than this morning session. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so if you do think you have yeah. an empathy problem, or even if you don't, um, be aware of it. And if you don't have that many, that's very good, but keep it clean and be aware. If you do well, you have to do something about it. And one of the first things you have to do, next slide, please, is to... Oh, before that, I always forget this. I, I do apologize. <laughs> um, yes, so you do have a nematode problem in ornamentals, for example, in roses in Kenya. We've, we've, we've sampled quite a number of farms. This is just an example. And that red line is kind of the threshold for when we, it's like 25 nematodes per five gram of roots. But anyway, this is just to show you that nematodes are a problem uh, in uh, roses in Kenya, um, amongst other <clears throat> crops. So yes, yeah, so back to what I started. Um, sampling is very important um, to find your, you know, what you've got and where. And, and we're going to share with you, if you want, um, this guide here, um, Practical Plant Nematology Guide, which we have in digital form, which I recommend that you read. It will help you. Um, and so sampling is important. You have to know where to sample and how to sample. You sample in, in the root zone to find your nematodes. And how to sample, by that I mean, if you have an area that you suspect you have nematodes, you have to sample by taking many cores in that area to represent the area, not just take a few samples exactly where there is damage because nematodes might have migrated um, to the other plants. The, there'll be less food on the most damaged plants. So that's important. So for example, in a 100 square meter area, you might take 10 subsamples to make one composite sample and label it very clearly for the nematology um, lab that will be analyzing it for you. If you do, if you are not careful with your labeling, you'll lose your result and, and it'll be wasted time. Uh, important also is the storage. Um, don't store your nematodes for long. These are live animals, so and they don't tolerate sunlight or too much heat. Don't put the, the, the sample in the sun. Um, so be aware of these kind of things regarding sampling. And this is just to show you somebody sampling a potato field. The arrow there in the greenhouse just indicating that go into the root zone. And the other picture is just to indicate don't overdo the sampling in terms of soil. About one liter or a kilo per composite sample is, is a fine size um, to take. Right. Oh, and then just to share with you, there, there is a process once the, the sample comes into a lab, there's a process of extracting those nematodes from soil and roots. It's not it's, it's certain methods to get them out of soil and roots, which takes some time. Um, and then you get them in a beaker. And then what is next? Let's see, once you process your samples. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a 
maybe an obvious question for you, but it's just good to ask if you've been paying attention. So are all nematodes bad? Question for you. Yes or oh, no, I'm not sure. Oh no, so we've got 91% say no, but a couple of people saying that yes, they are all bad. Oh. Mm. A little bit more of a comment, a couple of not sures. Well, let us educate you. Well, let us, <laughs> okay, well the answer is um, not all nematodes are bad. <laughs> brings us a little bit to the next slide here. So when we, when nematodes have been extracted, it's time to identify what is there. And uh, so not, not all nematodes are bad. So it's important to then in our nematode sample to be able to differentiate between those good nematodes and bad nematodes. And that uh, requires a bit of expertise, which is why we've got NEM Africa here, among others. We are training or being trained to, to, to do this work amongst other things. Um, and then once you find plant parasitic nematodes within them, there's certain species that we have to differentiate. So it's quite a process, but luckily we also got molecular methods that help us to, to, to um, do it quicker and uh, more accurately as well, as long as you know what you've got. Right, so once you, you know you've got an embryo problem, you've got to um, manage them. So as with any crop pests, you've got to um, uh, reduce your infestation to the non-injurious level, um, use different strategies, so IPM, uh, sustainable, be sustainable so that the, the management strategy lasts, and also, of course, consider environment, the environment and human health. So the principles, I think, is the next slide uh, of nematode management is uh, generally uh, direct kill, um, starvation, or inhibiting their reproduction. So in the next slide, I'll just um, go through these various management options with a few examples. And it's an overview, so I'm not going to give you a recipe for anything. It's just to maybe make you think and just give you some ideas. And <clears throat> Uh, the first one is prevention. So you want to avoid getting nematodes into your, into your crop. Next slide, please. <laughs> and one of the first things, next slide, is um, healthy planting material. You don't really want to bring in a diseased plant and start you know, your crop with that. That's, that'll be a disaster. But then I have a question for you. <clears throat> what type of planting material do you use in your, on your farm? Uh, Liz, please. And there's three options there. Yeah, so we've got three options now. That's all launched. Uh-huh. Oh, very again, very different from this morning. This morning it was a little bit more close, okay. but let's uh, let's let it settle. So at the moment, disease-free planting material is in the lead at 50%, uh-huh. followed by commercial propagated seedlings and only seven with on-farm on -farm planting materials. So it's only seven people, 20%. Oh, that's a bit different. Yeah, so that's yeah. well done. We're all doing that. Yes. This morning. Then you're doing the right thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, another uh, um, another strategy or another um, uh, option um, that is useful can be useful for some plant material, for example, banana suckers. Um, something that we do, or Danny more rather, um, uh, in banana production for smallholders, it's very useful to use. Uh, boiling water treatment, because it's kind of easy, you don't have to measure any temperature, and you can use it for 30 seconds, and it, and it works well. Uh, but there are other recommendations regarding hot, hot water treatment that you can look at, for example, for bulbs or certain other plants, but it's also a useful method. Then um, <clears throat> it's important to avoid spreading of nematodes and disease in your, on your farm or in your screen, greenhouse. Is so I, I guess you're probably aware of this, but that nematodes can be you know, spread with uh, tiny soil particles on tools and tires, boots, etc. So that's good to be aware of. And then also maybe, I think, maybe not all of you are aware that, but actually nematodes are um, sometimes found in irrigation water. So that's important to sample that. Um, and that is how actually nematodes can come into hydroponics, as uh, Danny mentioned in his talk. You can get, uh, you wouldn't think you'd get nematodes in, in there, but if you do have them in your irrigation water, then they can come in that way. So that's important to, to be aware of and think of how you can stop that. Um, regulatory practices. Um, Daisy will talk about this, but there are um, rules and regulations out there by countries and, and also internationally to prevent uh, importing nematodes that you don't want and also to prevent spread within countries. But Daisy will mention more on that. 
Then there's physical management. And I think you, many of you may be aware of soil steam, which is a very useful method for, for um, I guess, cleaning the non-toxically um, disinfecting soil. Um, and I think next slide, I just got advantages and disadvantages. So it's quite easy to apply if you've got the machine and you know the, the equipment for it on small scale screen houses. But the main uh, thing to think of with, with regard to nematodes is the depth of effect, because um, if um, depth, you know when you steam, if you have too much soil there, it's not going to reach all the nematodes, and then uh, so they might go down to where it's it's not so hot. And then when you plant your material, the nematodes will come up to a free and easy environment without any <laughs> any um, uh, enemies or natural enemies, and will really cause havoc to your plants. So to be aware of the depth of the effect. <clears throat> I'm not gonna say so much on biofumigation and organic amendments, but it's something that's taking hold after uh, methyl bromide has been banned. So there are some, there is some research out there on um, using various organic amendments. So some of, I just mentioned some here, and even we are doing a bit of research on that. So that's just to, keep, to be aware of that, look out for that, because it could be useful in your cropping cycle to include some of these amendments. Right, then there's cultural management, and uh, that's cropping systems. And I have another question for you. Um, so do you practice crop rotation in your farm? If you can answer yes or no. Yes, that's launched everybody. You say no. Mm -hmm. oh, it's very, so you've got about 60-ish percent. Okay. So what, yes. was it, what was it this morning? Um, about the same, I think. B40 about this morning, yes. Ah, okay. Right, not bad. Better. <laughs> so crop rotation is opposed to mono cropping. Um, you're using different crops to keep your population down. So you've got to know, use resistant crops or non-hosts in terms of your nematode. And I think the next slide says a little bit more about just the challenge that we do need a bit of knowledge about the species there and their biology. So we do know for some, but there's still work to be done here on this, but, it, but it's, a, it's a, good, um, a good management option uh, also for smallholders. <clears throat> this graph is just an example for some, a field trial we did with relation to um, um, potato cyst nematodes. And we've got here three C a field trial over three seasons where we're uh, measuring the nematode population uh, in those seasons and the three first uh, uh, graphs, graphs, right? Um, are potatoes, the Shangi, Mayan, Dutch, the so three potato varieties grown over three seasons. You see the nematode population staying the same or going sky high to way above the threshold level, which is that red line. Whereas when the next two are nightshade varieties, which are host but resistant host, you see it suppresses the population, as does amaranth there, which is a non host and fallow. So it's worth, so this is just to demonstrate that crop rotation can work. Uh, following crop and cover crop is, the, is also um, a nice cultural management option. It's easy to use, but of course, um, and this is where the nematode, you'll starve the nematode, but you've got to be weed free. But then again, it's also doesn't give you any economic benefit and can cause um, land erosion. So cover cropping um, might be a good, especially a legumous, leg, what's it called, legumous cover crop, which would give nitrogen into the soil, could be a good option to get your nematode um, population down. <coughs> Excuse me. Then host resistance. This is a very important option and very useful one and probably the best one. Um, um, just here to differentiate the types of host response to nematodes and pests. Resistance is when uh, you prevent the nematode from multiplying on the plants. So they might be thick, but not be able to develop. Tolerance is the ability of um, the plants to grow well, but the nematodes multiply and build up. Susceptible, the plant will not grow well, and, but and nematodes will build up. <clears throat> so next slide, just to say a little bit about, which I said already, I think, but this is really the best, one of the best options for nematode control, useful, relatively cheap, and pre prevents reproduction of nematodes. But there are, um, there are challenges, um, takes years to develop, and there are rather few plant material or plant material that are resistant in many cases. 
so there's not so much to choose from. I put grafting here because grafting is also part of resistance. You can have um, resistant rootstock in roses, tomatoes, those exist. Uh, the trouble is if there's so little material out there, it, there is a, um, a chance or a um, temptation to use them too often where then resistance can be broken. And also you might select a virulent nematode population if you use it, overuse, <coughs> excuse me, overuse the resistant. Um, until my voice is going, sorry. <laughs> mm. Right, briefly on to biological control. I'm just gonna uh, very briefly uh, describe or introduce some fungi. There's something called nematode trapping fungi, but they might trap any nematode until maybe somebody finds the nematode trapping fungi that might just go for root knot. But at the moment, there isn't as far as I know that. But here we have um, uh, purpuricillium or pistillomyces, it used to be called lilacinus, which is an egg parasite. And here we have some uh, products out there on the market, which are quite good, I think. Then we have uh, Pachonia, which is not in the market here. I'm a little bit unsure, but it's also an egg parasite. And then we have a bacteria, the next slide, I think. Uh, Pasteria penetrans, which um, is uh, an interesting parasite, latches, the spore latches onto the nematode and then kills the nematode from within. Again, product-wise, maybe we'll, we'll come back to that in the discussion, but at the moment there is no product on the market of that one, but there is um, like, watch this space. <laughs> and finally, uh, amongst the biocontrols, there's, there's trichoderma products, and these um, fungi colonize the roots and thereby protect the plant from nematode attack, and some species might also affect nematodes uh, directly. And these are quite useful because they have that, um, they induce the, uh, um, uh, I mean, um, immunity of the plant. <clears throat> so these are useful products on the market. <clears throat> then we have chemical management. And amongst them, we have some bio nematicides, which are also coming up. Since there are, you know, lack, there are not that many nematicides on the market, bio nematicides are useful because they're less toxic and so on, but they, they might not always work as well as we want. But there are neem products out there various plant extracts, and then there's a newish one, garlic nemgard, which are worth trying. And we are also we're looking at garlic, actually, how well it works against PCM. Synthetic pesticides, uh, Daisy will definitely talk more about that, but they're very useful to use when uh, populations are high, and you have to you know how to use it well. So if, if they're used correctly, then uh, pesticides or nematicides are good to use, actually. Um, and if the crop is valuable, it's, it's useful to use nematicides because they might be expensive. So it has to be worth it. So now I have a question for you. Do you use, do you use nematicides on your farm? Yes, I've just launched the final question. Uh -huh. So this morning it was a majority yes, I think. Uh -huh. We're a little bit closer today, 50, almost 50, oh, 50-50. Oh wow! Okay. So they are being used. Very close different. again. Yeah, very yeah. close. Good. Thanks, everyone. Great. So then, I think I've just maybe I hope I haven't rushed through that, but I hope I've given you a picture of um, how to manage nematodes. And really, the key step, as I hope you know now, is really to go out there and, and uh, sample and I get your nematodes identified. Know your nematode. Uh, be sure to use different methods. And finally, I. Uh, wouldn't hesitate to ask a nematologist. Mm. Thank you very much, and I hope we can interact and look forward to your questions later.